Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Let me first thank the President and the Council for inviting me uh, to uh, give this talk, and thank you, Chair, for your kind introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, in my talk, uh, I have no uh, conflict of interest, although we have been a part of a multi-center cardiovascular trials uh, for citagliptin and the HGL2 inhibitors, I have no conflict of interest. In my talk, I'm going to talk to you about changing global trends of diabetes, which already uh, Prasad has uh, gone through, and cardiovascular outcomes in type 2 diabetes, and cardiovascular outcome trials, and integrating evidence into practice, and then few, uh, and do we really live up to the hype, and also few take home messages. Ladies and gentlemen, when you look at diabetes, there are 537 million adults living with diabetes, one in, one in 10 of the global population. And uh, this number is predicted to be rise to 643 million, uh, and then to 783 million in 2045. Over three, in, uh, three out of four adults of diabetes living in low and middle income countries, therefore young doctors in this audience will see more and more patients in time to come and diabetes is responsible for about 6.7 million deaths worldwide. So if you look at the diabetes in South Asia, always, already Prasad has spoken about it, I just want to show one point, uh, the re regional prevalence just 8.7 in 2021 according to the IDF 2022, and go, go, uh, uh, expected to go up to 9.6 and 11.3 in 2045, but I think we are, we are beyond these uh, uh, projections even now. So ladies and gentlemen, when you took up, uh, consider about the cardiovascular uh, risk, we all know that the causes of death in type 2 diabetes, if you consider the majority of the patients are dying with a cardiovascular disease, if you get together, it's about 66% of patients with diabetes will die with a cardiovascular disease. Therefore, cardiovascular causes remain the leading cause of death in diabetes, and if you need to uh, reduce the mortality in diabetes, you need to address this issue uh, promptly. So if you look at the uh, causes like the sudden cardiac death is going to be about 30% in diabetes and then the acute MI 5.3% and cerebrovascular disease about 7.1%. So ladies and gentlemen, if you look at the risk factors of ASCVD, diabetes is a major risk factor for ASCVD, then dyslipidemia and hypertension. Now if you get a diabetic patient, more than 50% of our patients are having multiple uh, these risk factors together, therefore they have a huge cardiovascular risk. So when you look at controlling these risk factors, you can control individual risk factors efficaciously in preventing and slowing the ACVD in people with diabetes, but if you don't want to do it the proper way, it should be the greater benefit when multiple cardiovascular risk factors are addressed simultaneously. So if you look at this again, you will understand that 10.5% 10, 10 of patients will die from a heart failure in diabetes. It's a, it's, a, it's a huge amount. And if you look at that separately, incidence of hospitalization for heart failure tw twice higher in people with diabetes when you compare with the non-diabetic patients. And if you look at, it can be either ejection fraction preserved or reduced heart failure. Again, if you look at the risk factors for heart failure in diabetes, it's again hypertension and the ACVD. So we need to address these things together. So there's a shift in current diabetes care. We started about 10 years ago with a glucocentric approach where we look at the HbA1c and a fasting blood sugar mainly and then targeting them uh, into the uh, target levels. But then we thought about the patient-centered approach later. Now we have come into the individual cardiovascular risk factors and glycemic targets to be achieved together. So ladies and gentlemen, if you look at the risk, of fac risk factors of diabetes, you know, duration of diabetes, the major risk factor, if you look at any risk engine, if you put the duration, there's going to be a huge increase in, in diabetes risk. And also the obesity and the hypertension, dyslipidemia, smoking, then family history of premature deaths is going to be another risk factor, then the CKD and the presence of albuminuria, all going to be risk factors. For, for cardiovascular disease in diabetes. If you look at this older study, uh, Steno2, that is uh, published very uh, few many years ago, if you look at the study period of eight years, when you compare the conventional versus intensive glycemic control arms, in the intensive arm, there's a multifactorial intervention, 
with uh, hypertension, dyslipidemia, then patients who need aspirin, given aspirin and lifestyle modification, there's a huge reduction of uh, cardiovascular outcomes. What happens after eight years, they followed up to, up to about 13 years, and there's about 50% reduction in the cardiovascular risk if you look at the multiple risk factor approach in managing diabetes. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, you all understand that lifestyle modification and diabetes education is very important. They are you not only the diet, exercise, and try to get the, the proper weight, as well as stop smoking and things are important in the lifestyle modification. Then the glycemic management is important, then blood pressure management is important, then the lipids then come into the agents with cardiovascular and renal benefits to be collected properly. If you do all that, probably we are going to reduce cardiovascular risk in type 2 diabetes. So I'm going to go through about glycemic management. If you look at this data, the fasting blood sugar more than 7 elevate the cardiovascular risk. If you look at, if you compare with more than 7 versus less than 7, if you look at the hazard ratios, there's an increased risk of uh, cardiovascular outcomes if you have a higher fasting blood sugar. Now, if you look at the elevated blood glucose concentration, uh, again, the cardiovascular outcome, if you look at this mean fasting glucose concentration against hazard ratio, actually, you can see that there is a J-shaped curve, increasing cardiovascular risk with increasing fasting blood sugar. So, looking at further into the glycemic targets, I put all these uh, previous studies together, just want to look at the UK PDS because it's a type 2 diabetes, diabetes study. And if you look at the microvascular complication, there's no doubt that uh, you have a reduction in when you have, a, when you have a, uh, 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 strict control of glucose. But if you look at the uh, UK PDS follow-up study, if you do something better in early disease, like when you start early, that when, when you start newly diagnosed type 2 diabetes, and if you get a strict blood sugar control early, the uh, UK PDS has very, very clearly shown that after a very long period of time, there is a cardiovascular risk reduction and mortality reduction. But if you look at the ACCORD, ADVANCE, and VADT, they are quite different studies to UK PDS. They are in the ACCORD, ADVANCE, and VADT, the patients are having diabetes for about, uh, about uh, six to eight years with the multiple cardiovascular risk factors. When you have that, if you go into the strict control of blood sugar control, but there is no major cardiovascular outcome benefit in later on in the life. Therefore, what you need to understand is do early intensive control if you want to get a better outcome. So if you look at the uh, HbA1c, mean HbA1c and a mortality in diabetic individuals with heart failure, you will see that uh, when you have HbA1c between 7 and 8, you have a reduced uh, hazard ratio. And if you have a low HbA1c, it increases your hazard ratio. And it's more than 9, again, increase your hazard ratio. Therefore, we have a, uh, we have a very small window to deal with it with HbA1c if you want to reduce the cardiovascular risk. So ladies and gentlemen, what the, what the guideline says, ADA says that keep the HbA1c less than 6.5 6 in young patients without any cardiovascular disease. But if you have diabetes with cardiovascular disease, having diabetes for a longer time, probably keep it less than 7. But if you go into the ESC, EASD guidelines, they have gone into slightly below. They say that younger patients without cardiovascular disease, you keep it HbA1c between 6 and 6.5. And if you have multiple cardiovascular risk factors, the long-term diabetes, you keep around 7. Few words about anti-diabetic treatment that you're going to see loads of slides later on. Just about metformin, uh, metformin UK PDS 34 study, which was a which was uh, published very 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 much earlier. If you look at this study, you have about uh, quite number of patients metformin, obese patients metformin, uh, newly diagnosed patients put on metformin. Now, if you look at this outcome of UK PDS. Uh, study, you will clearly see that if you put metformin in early disease of diabetes, if you, if you see that 36% reduction in all-cause mortality and 39% reduction in, in MI if you, uh, if you start metformin early. Now, if you look at metformin uh, UK PDS follow-up study, even after 10 years of follow-up, you can, you can still see a significant benefit of cardiovascular outcome with metformin when you start metformin in the early, newly diagnosed type 2 diabetes. So ladies and gentlemen, according to this data, primary prevention strategy against CV risk among the patients newly diagnosed type 2 diabetes 
without established cardiovascular disease, metformin has a place, but in the secondary prevention, when you have cardiovascular disease, probably metformin has no place in reducing cardiovascular outcomes. Few words about SGL2 2 inhibitors, and we all know that after a cold study in 2008, new FDA requirements came into practice. All the diabetes medications should go through a cardiovascular outcome trials before getting into the FDA approval. So after that, we got so many studies because of all the all the all the drugs should have gone through this uh, uh, FDA approval. So they they have we had so many cardiovascular outcome studies. I just want to show you the meta-analysis of the SGL2, SGLT2 cardiovascular outcome trials. I put everything together, Empire Canal study, then declare credence and everything together, even a DEP, IHF and everything I put together. And you will understand that CV death and, and heart failure for hospital uh, uh, hospitalization favors the, uh, the SGLT2 inhibitors when you compare the placebo. So what it means that treatment with SGL2 2 inhibitors, sustained reduction in composite outcomes of CV death, hospitalization for heart failure, total mortality, and major adverse cardiovascular outcomes. So when you look at SGL2 2 inhibitors, moderate benefits in cardiovascular disease, robust benefits in heart failure and the renal disease, and considered for primary and secondary prevention of CVD in patients with metformin, so that the patients with type 2 diabetes. So it is for the primary as well as secondary prevention, SGLT2 inhibitors. Few words about GLP-1 analogs. I have put everything together here again, cardiovascular benefits of GLP-1 analogs. I put all the studies together to, because of the time factor. If you, look at the, if you look at these two studies out, and if you look at the other studies, all the studies have shown there is a cardiovascular benefits and the renal benefits of GLP-1 analogs. So what it means is that GLP-1 receptor agonists will reduce major adverse cardiovascular events by 14%, all-cause mortality by about 12%, hospital admissions for heart failures by about 11%. So that's what about the GLP-1 analogs, and we know that the dual GIP GLP-1 agonist tercipatide, the ongoing trial, and uh, it actually it's compared to the dulagutide, which was confirmed to have a cardiovascular protective effect. They are looking at the maze, myocardial infarction, strokes, and CV death, and it's a 54-month trial. We will get the results in 2024. So, ladies and gentlemen, GLP-1 receptor agonist, if you show benef beneficial effects on CVD and heart failure, there is no, no uh, uh, doubt about it. Recommended in context of secondary prevention, in type 2 diabetes and CVD, so when you compare with this GLT2 inhibitors. Few words about DPP4 inhibitors and the cardiovascular outcomes with major adverse cardiovascular events. I have put all three studies, saver, uh, examine, as well as TCO studies together. You will understand that there is no cardiovascular outcome benefit in, GL, uh, in uh, DPP4 inhibitors. So DPP4 inhibitors, neutral with regard to the CV outcomes, therefore, you need to think about this when you start uh, DPP-4 inhibitors patient. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, glucose lowering drugs in type 2 diabetes and the CVD impact, I put everything together. I didn't talk about insulin because it's neutral. All of you know that. Sulfonylureas are neutral in cardiovascular disease. Metformin, yes, if you start early, there is a benefit. But if you start later, probably no benefit. Uh, 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 pyoglitazone, I didn't uh, talk about it, but there are some benefits, but there are heart failures, probably almost uh, there is no outcomes when you consider together. Uh, DP4 inhibitors is neutral, GLP1 analogs, there is a benefit in the secondary prevention, most probably SGLT2 inhibitors, primary as well as secondary prevention. So, recommendation for anti diabetic medications, what the ADA says is that. If you are for the SGLT2 inhibitors and the GLP-1 analogs, patients with type 2 diabetes establish ACVD or multiple risk factors of CVD or established kidney disease, then you consider uh, SGLT2 or a GLP-1. SGLT2 inhibitor can be considered with type 2 diabetes with established heart failures with reduced uh, ejection fraction. What the ESC and EASD says is that when you have a SGLT2 inhibitor and a GLP-1 analog, patients with newly diagnosed type 2 diabetes and established ACVD or very, risk, very high risk factor CVD even before metformin 
you consider SGL22 inhibitors. So there are differences in these two very clearly. Uh, ESD says that you can start SGL22 inhibitors at the first option. So ladies and gentlemen, I covered glycemic management to a certain extent. I covered the agents with cardiovascular protection to a certain extent. So next is blood pressure. So if you look at the cardiovascular outcomes and the blood pressure levels in type 2 diabetes, if you look at the diastolic uh, uh, blood pressure, increasing diastolic blood pressure increases the cardiovascular risk. And also if you look at the systolic blood pressure, increasing systolic blood pressure in diabetes increases the cardiovascular risk. Just want to show a few, one slide on sprint trial, although the patients of diabetes were excluded from this slide, so it's not actually relevant here, but I just want to show that because it is a BP, uh, BP lowering between 120 systolic blood pressure versus 140 systolic blood pressure, but results are extremely good. Resulted in 25% reduction in MI, uh, coronary, coronary disease, strokes, heart failure, death, death attributed to CVD an intensive targeted reduced risk of death by 25% if you reduce your systolic blood pressure to less than 120, but it's a non-diabetic population. So ladies and gentlemen, you know about the ACCORD BP trial, the, uh, the systolic blood pressure 120 versus 140 were compared here, and when you look at the primary composite car cardiovascular outcome, was there's no non-significant reduction of cardiovascular outcome, therefore no, there's no major difference between 120 versus 140. STEP trial, which is uh, had 8,500 participants, but that has about 1,600 1, diabetic patients. What they did was intensive arm was less than 130 systolic blood pressure versus uh, uh, conventional arm was a bit higher, actually 150. When you uh, look at 130 versus 150 in systolic blood pressure, you see a, a significant reduction in cardiovascular outcomes, about 26% cardiovascular outcomes, and this contains the diabetic patients as well uh, in this particular uh, SPIN trial. So it reduces the strokes, acute coronary syndromes, acute uh, decompensated heart failure, coronary vascularization, and death from cardiovascular causes by about 25%. Few words about the HOT trial for the diastolic blood pressure in diabetes. When you compare the blood pressure, systolic, the diastolic blood pressure, 90 versus 80, 80 less than 80 is red. Major cardiovascular events are tremendously reduced with significant amounts when you have a diastolic blood pressure less than 80. MI again, significant reduction. Cardiovascular mortality again, significant reduction. Diastolic blood pressure of 80 compared to 90 resulted in about 51% reduction in the cardiovascular events in diabetes. Therefore, it's important that you try and get the target diastolic blood pressure. If you look at the meta-analysis of all these studies together in, in blood pressure and uh, blood pressure reduction in, in type 2 diabetes, you will understand it is favoring the, the intensive control of blood pressure when you compare with the conventional control. So mean blood pressure of 133.76 was associated with 14% reduction in MACE compared to the mean blood pressure of 140.81. Benefit was greatest in the people with diabetes. To targets of the control of blood pressure that uh, going into the back into the guidelines of ADA, 140.90 if the patients have got diabetes with hypertension with low risk and if the patient has high risk of cardiovascular cardiovascular disease, so ADA says reduced blood pressure less than 130. But what the EASD, ESC says is that uh, it should be less than 130-80. Sorry about the mistake there. 130-80 if the patients are having blood hypertension and diabetes together. So strict control in the EASD more than a, a, a ADA, but I have shown you the, all the data so you can decide what to follow. So ladies and gentlemen, I covered the blood pressure as well. Then I have lipids. Uh, if you look at the lipids, lower is better in lipids. All the randomized control trials on statins as well as prospective studies on statins shows that lower the, lower the uh, LDL cholesterol, lower the cardiovascular disease in diabetes. It's a log linear relationship between the absolute change in plasma LDL cholesterol and risk of ACVD. I also have put all the primary and prevention, primary and secondary prevention studies in diabetes together uh, in a one slide to show you that uh, in, or in primary or secondary prevention, uh, lowering the LDL uh, 
uh, L lower the cardiovascular risk. Actually, there is no lower, lower cutoff for the LDL, and it will come further down because lower is better, even lowering will have no other complications as well. So statin effects on lipids, I have shown you atovastatin, rosuvastatin, and simvastatin here. Here, dark color shows statin. So higher the dose, higher the LDL cholesterol reduction in the statins. When you add acetamide onto the statin in the lighter color, shows that there is an increased reduction of LDL cholesterol in all three, uh, uh, three that I have shown you here. So ladies and gentlemen, degree of LDL cholesterol reduction is dose dependent and varies between the different statins. And high in intensity statins, that is ATOA 40 to 80 and ROSUA statin 20 to 40, reduce LDL by more than 50% and moderate intensity will reduce about 30 to 50% in LDL cholesterol. If you look at the meta-analysis further, statins are the most effective therapy for reducing cardiovascular outcomes in type 2 diabetes. So ladies and gentlemen, going back into, back into the guidelines, ADA says LDL cholesterol reduction more than 50% from the baseline with the patients with diabetes, the more than 20% of cardiovascular risk. What the EASD, ESA says is that they go on, on targets, less than 100, 100 milligrams per deciliter if the patient has diabetes, the moderate cardiovascular risk. Further reduction to 70 if you have a type 2 diabetes, high cardiovascular risk, 55 if you have a very high cardiovascular risk. If you get uh, myocardial involvement, even with the statin, you can go further down to reduce the cardiovascular risk in type 2 diabetes. So I have done lipids as well, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Few words about antiplatelets. There is a primary prevention, but all of you know secondary prevention. There's no doubt about antiplatelets in the primary prevention. I just want to show you the ASCEN study with, uh, with patient population with diabetes, 15,000 patients, 12% reduction in the relative cardiovascular outcomes, but number needed to treat is 91. And also if you look at the relative risk of major bleeding is 29% increase. So number needed to harm is 111. So you are having a, a close window there, 91 versus 111. That's why the primary prevention the aspirin became a bit of an issue. So what the guideline says is that aspirin 75 to 160 may be considered as a primary prevention strategy. Those with diabetes, the increased cardiovascular risk after a comprehensive discussion with the patient. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, do we live up to the hype? Are we doing all these things together in our patients? So if you look at the data, the prevalence of CVD in type 2 diabetes before 2016 and in 2019, if you look at all cardiovascular diseases coming down from 2016 to 2019, if you look at coronary artery disease, again the percentage is coming down. When you look at the 2019, heart attacks again coming down up to a greater extent in 2019 when you compare the 2016, even strokes and heart failure. So, consistent with the decline trend of CVD in type 2 diabetes, the incidence of death from CVD steadily dropping uh, from 2016 to 2019 with probably the better management and better me medications for managing cardiovascular disease in type 2 diabetes. However, the decreasing incidence of CVD and cardiovascular mortality wa was reported mainly in the high-income countries. So if you look at the large gap still remains in the incidence of cardiovascular morbidity and mortality between the people with type 2 diabetes and those without diabetes. And also paucity of data with cardiovascular disease incidence among people with type 2 diabetes in the middle and the low income countries. And I also couldn't find anything in Sri Lanka to show you. So we exactly we don't know whether we actually uh, doing the correct thing at the moment, but global data suggests that there is a declining cardiovascular uh, disease in type 2 diabetes. So ladies and gentlemen, take home messages, CVD remains the leading cause of death in type 2 diabetes. Intensive multiple, multifactorial therapy is associated with the improved cardiovascular outcomes in diabetes. Correcting major abnormalities in type 2 diabetes, hyperglycemia appears to be an effect on cardiovascular risk reduction long term uh, 
And if you look at the positive clinical trials over the last five to six years, lead to rapid evolution of use of new agents with cardiovascular benefits in diabetes care in order to reduce the cardiovascular outcomes. And attention should be given to lipid management, blood pressure management, and platelet therapy simultaneously to improve the cardiovascular outcomes, to reduce the cardiovascular outcomes in diabetes. Thank you.